grace and peace to you from the one who was and is and is to come. Amen. It is Harvest Festival this Sunday. But according to the Apostle Paul, all of life is to be one long harvest celebration, inviting us to think of ourselves as sowers gifted with precious seeds to be sown as an act of solidarity and compassion. This comes out most clearly in his second letter to the Corinthians. Paul encourages the congregation to raise funds for the poor brothers and sisters in Jerusalem who were suffering a severe famine. And he evokes the metaphor of sowing and reaping to inspire a generous offering. Paul begins his fundraiser with reminding them of a proverbial saying. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. This is the beauty of metaphors. They open up new ways of seeing the world and our place in it. What if we would begin to see ourselves as sowers sent into the fields of our lives with bags of precious seeds entrusted to us? Do we not speak about planting a new seed when sharing a new idea with someone? We also talk about seed money when helping a project to finally take off. Paul also evokes the metaphor of sowing and reaping in order to help us reimagine our relationship to money and fundraising. Just as a small seed holds the promise of new growth, our offering to an individual or an organization holds enormous promise when seen not just as a donation, but as an investment into our shared future. And why so sparingly? if sowing generously promises the shared joy of a rich harvest. Paul's fundraiser is meant to signal solidarity and compassion beyond the usual concern for one's own life and community. Such giving raises important questions about our relationship to others and ourselves. Human beings might very well not live by bread alone, but if they don't have bread to eat, then all the preaching and teaching in the world will not fill empty stomachs. Paul therefore insists that material generosity is part and parcel of the spiritual life. Money and spirit cannot be separated. And while our primal instinct might suggest to us that sharing only makes us poorer, Paul is convinced that emptying ourselves for the sake of others enables a greater fullness from which both the giver and receiver benefit. Vasily Kandinsky's landscapes invite us to enter the fields of our lives of heightened senses. How can we become more conscious of life being about a constant sowing and reaping? How do we live our lives not from a place of fear, of scarcity, but from a place of trust in divine abundance? Do we not receive in giving? And do we not also give in receiving? Are giver and receiver not bound up together in the joy of a generous harvest? Kandinsky himself was also on a spiritual quest exploring the possibilities of a greater fullness and abundance hidden in color, form, and line. When he moved from being a figurative landscape artist to becoming a modernist master of radically abstract language, the spiritual vision of his paintings became more and more apparent. He began to understand painting as an alternative pathway to spiritual reality. He kept stripping away descriptive details and reducing the painting to recognizable elements and calligraphic lines. Large areas of vibrant color were meant to stimulate emotions associated with classical music. It was through such abstraction that he felt to have discovered a spiritual reality which was more powerful for not being tied to the outside world. An alternative 
music for the senses. And colors were said to become vibrations of the soul. Paul was also on a spiritual quest and an artist in his own way. He kept reimagining the visible world in light of a spiritual reality that through Christ was ever present to him and waiting to be embodied in his own life and the congregations he ministered to. He grounded his vision of generous sowing and reaping in the spiritual reality of a Christ who emptied himself for the sake of our fullness. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. This is a foundational Christian confession, poetic in nature, and possibly in parts even a citation from an early Christian hymn. The notion of Christ becoming poor so that we might become rich gives Paul's vision of a generous sowing and reaping even greater depth and beauty. For our own sowing and reaping is then a powerful echo of what Christ himself modeled for us. And did the historical Jesus not go even further by comparing himself to a seed that must be sown and die in order to bear much fruit? But despite this huge calling to imitate Christ's very own willingness to abandon all privilege and power in order to empower us with the dignity of being God's children, the Apostle Paul resists becoming legalistic about our own giving. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We are to give what we have decided in our own heart. What does that mean? Paul speaks about not giving reluctantly. Indeed, it is possible to give generously with the hand, but to continue to grasp the gift with your heart and to wish you had never given. Such generosity may still benefit the recipient but it will not fill the giver with the kind of joy Paul anticipates. And we are not to give under compulsion. Paul resists any form of legalism. He does not refer to the Old Testament standard of 10%. Giving is not meant to be for the fulfillment of a legal obligation. We are not to compare and judge each other. It is the cheerful giver who is inspired by Jesus' own self-giving whom God loves. We are to imagine ourselves to be blessed and in awe when holding a bag of seeds in our hands. What a promise of joy and growth they contain. Indeed, everything begins small, but once sown, those seeds are able to grow, feeding the hungry and nurturing the vision of a shared future where all have access to what they need to live and thrive. We encourage to think of our material wealth as a bag of seeds we are entrusted with. We are to think of them not simply as an offering, but as an investment in the kingdom of God. Those seeds carry within them the promise of turning this world into a plentiful garden in which no one has to go hungry. But it is up to us to sow them, not reluctantly or under compulsion, but out of the joy of becoming a channel of God's unreserved and undivided abundance of love and care. Paul continues to highlight how such joy is also inspired by the promise of an even greater abundance in one's own life 
which in turn allows one to be even more generous and giving. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. We should note that the blessing of abundance is not about having what we desire, but what we need. And the abundance of having our basic needs met is meant to inspire us to abound in every good work. To have our basic needs met is to set, be set free to be even more generous and giving toward others. The Apostle Paul feels inspired by a verse from Psalm 112, which says they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. The sowing of seeds becomes the scattering of gifts to the poor. The ever-enduring righteousness the psalmist praises is the ongoing desire for justice. Paul's fundraiser is about food justice. Ellen Brody, CEO and founder of SA Harvest, is an advocate for such food justice in our own country. He speaks about a hunger crisis in South Africa. Up to 20 million South Africans are severely food insecure, with millions of children going to bed hungry each night. He states that 27% of our children under the age of five suffer from malnutrition, stunting, and wasting. In all of this is happening in a country with an abundance of food. The amount of nutritious food wasted in our food chain from farms to retailers is staggering. We waste 10 million tons annually, equivalent to 30 billion meals. With 20 million people on a spectrum of severe food vulnerability, the need in a year is around 20 billion meals. The statistics indicate that the wasted food alone could feed all those in need. And from an ecological perspective, we need to take note that the wasted food and organic waste going into landfills emit up to 450 million kilograms of methane gas annually. As a harvest advocates, the kind of legislation that will curb waste and ensure that rescued food reaches those in need. More pressure needs to be put on supermarkets to donate unsold but edible food to charitable organizations. But ending hunger requires not only charity feeding, but also systemic intervention, addressing the root causes of food insecurity. SA Harvest has formed a multidisciplinary team of experts to propose a way forward for legislative reforms that prioritize food security and social justice. A more immediate and effective response would be to support the Grow Great campaign, proposing a solidarity basket of 10 disaster relief food items that could help to prevent a spike in acute malnutrition in vulnerable households. In South Africa, an estimated quarter of children under five suffer from nutritional stunting as a result of malnutrition. Grow Great therefore calls on food manufacturers, wholesalers and major retailers to assist families in making highly nutritious foods more affordable. A 30% discount would stretch the child support grant within reach of the daily dietary requirements of children. And international research has shown that only if children can grow well, the economy will grow well as well. For only with physical growth and brain development will children be able to learn well at school and contribute to productivity growth. Grow Great encourages the kind of sowing that becomes a successful investment in human capital. David Harrison rightly points out that economic development needs brain development, and brain development needs food. 
Psalm 112 is a triumphant praise of those who remain faithful to God's vision of justice in the land. And it is an acrostic poem in as far as in the Hebrew original, every line begins with the successive letters of the Hebrew alphabet. It was meant to make it easier to learn it by heart and fully internalize its vision. In quoting Psalm 112, the Apostle Paul makes it clear that he is not propagating a health and wealth gospel where those able to sow will reap an even greater harvest of material wealth. Sowing and reaping is rather about entering more fully into the prophetic vision of Shalom, a peace that is established through justice, especially for the poor. Joy then truly becomes to speak with David White, the meeting place of deep intentionality and of self-forgetting. This is why Paul continues to speak of such abundance again in terms of the metaphor of seeds. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply you and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. We should note that the abundance promised to generous sowers is an even fuller storeroom of seeds, offering the hope of an ever-growing harvest of justice and peace. It is a vision of growth that aims at making sure that no one has to suffer hunger. This prophetic vision runs against a consumer capitalism that relies on perpetual growth on a finite planet in order to maximize profit. Such an economic system is incompatible with the survival of life on Earth. What are the kind of new seeds then that need to be sown in order to give birth to an economic system that is sustainable and protects every generation's equal right to the enjoyment of natural wealth? Does Paul's summoning to a deeper and more generous sharing not counter the capitalist spirit of maximizing profit? An abundance that does not benefit everyone and destroys the earth, our home, is the very opposite of the prophetic vision of Shalom. Is Paul's vision of exponential growth not based on exponential sharing in order to meet everyone's basic needs. Paul closes his fundraiser for the poor by moving from the joy of giving to the harvest of gratitude. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Generous giving overflows in joyful prayers of gratitude. Such gratitude affirms that we are all equal to the gifted nature of life. Such gratitude gives expression to the privilege of participating together in a divine abundance that is so beautifully expressed in the play of colors of Kandinsky's landscapes. These colors are meant to move the soul and are music to Kandinsky's ears. They resonate with what David White describes as conversations without words, which are meant to deepen our natural sense of presence and therefore our natural sense of thankfulness, that everything happens both with and without us, that we are participant and witness all at once. In Paul's vision, giver and receiver find each other as both participant and witness to a divine love and care that is determined to bend the arc of history toward food justice for all. We started off with the Apostle Paul's call to his congregation to learn from those who know how to till the fields of their lives and be attentive to the ever-giving gift of sowing and reaping. 
The poet and Sufi mystic Rumi issued a similar invitation, calling us to meet him in the field, a place that will allow us to discover a greater fullness and oneness. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make sense. There's a greater fullness and oneness waiting for us. To enter this field is to be able to move beyond our ideas of right and wrongdoing. Indeed, our giving should not be done reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. To enter the field of God's abundance is to witness a greater fullness and oneness which summons us into a new way of being in the world and with each other. To enter the field is to realize how we are part of something much greater and larger than ourselves and that calls for humility and gratitude. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make sense, for we are indeed all one in an ever deepening and expanding web of life. And so as you enter the field, deep peace of the rolling hills to you, deep peace of the flowing air to you, deep peace of the shining stars to you, deep peace of the quiet earth to you, and deep peace of the sun of peace to you. Amen.